Okay, welcome back everyone to the second lecture today on the end times. Uh, we are in Revelation chapter 11 and uh, we're just going to resume by taking up some questions that are in the chat. Uh, so Kennedy's question is, Kennedy, I didn't understand your question. Maybe I just have to paraphrase it. it. Like in most cases, you see that there's some, there's some straining, there's a power that, that, that uh, restrains some action. Like in the case of death, we had to wait for two to three days for them to be resurrected. Who was restraining all these movements? Or who was controlling them? Um, I, I'm sorry, say that again, Kennedy. Uh, um, okay. Pretty... If, 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 if you look into the sequence of the events, mm -hmm. these are a strainer of all the actions. Like when they died, when these two people died for three days, they had to be restrained and brought back to life. Who was doing this? Was it through the power of the, the beast or the or Christ or who was restrained? Who was the controlling force by then? Oh, um so when when these two witnesses are killed they're killed by the beast that is the antichrist and he just lets their bodies lie there on the streets in jerusalem right so physically the bodies are there spirits would have already gone up to heaven right so he just says that nobody you know don't do anything to the body just leave it there in a way to mock them in a way to demean them and then, of course, you know, through the internet and television and other means, the whole world is seeing their bodies, the bodies of these two men lie in the streets of Jerusalem. And then while everybody is watching, I mean, while the whole world is watching, uh, their God raises them up, right? And God, uh, it says uh, life, the breath of life from God came and they stood them on their feet and, you know, they ascended before God, before all the people. So um, I'm not really sure I understood your question. Uh, y your question is, who is keeping their bodies on the street? Yeah, exactly. Who is the restrainer? Who is controlling the, 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 the death and the resurrection? Oh, uh, so, 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 so look at it in the physical realm. In the physical realm, it's the Antichrist. And he's the one who says, keep, leave their bodies, because their bodies are anyway dead. But spiritually, they're already with God. So if, if the question, and I mean, if, if, you, if, if um, the question is, oh, who's keeping their bodies on the ground? That's the Antichrist. And I guess the people around, they say, let's leave the bodies there as it is. You know, which happens even today, right? You know, when people get killed somewhere, people just leave their bodies there. Sometimes they don't care. And that's, you know, their physical bodies are lying dead somewhere, just like what how it happens today, right? So that's the same thing. Um, and then God raises them up, you know, and uh, lifts them up into heaven. So that resurrection is God's work. Yeah. So it means God is restraining the, the, the beast, not the Antichrist. Uh, why should God restrain the Antichrist? In, in what way, Kennedy? Because they are dead for three days, then they are arrested. But I think the intention of the Antichrist, of the, of the beast was to kill them, die permanently. Why resurrect them again? Is it restraining the powers of the, of the beast? So the beast kills them, right? The, the beast kills them. Uh, the Antichrist kills them and their dead bodies are dead for three days. I don't see any problem in that. I don't see any... Uh, why... Um, I'm not sure what... Uh, so the Antichrist kills them. They are dead. Their bodies are lying on the, gray, uh, on the ground. Uh, and the Antichrist wants to keep their bodies on the ground as a way to demean them. Uh, God doesn't have to restrain the Antichrist. Uh, 
right? Yeah, okay. I'm not sure if I really understood uh, what you were actually getting at, um, but um, the point is the beast, the Antichrist is given power and uh, uh, and uh, you know, he kills them and he lets their bodies lie on the ground and uh, uh, it says here, after three and a half days, God comes, God raises them up into heaven, which is all fine. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure exactly so, so, what. So, so, is it the Holy Spirit or are there the angels or what power? What power is controlling this in that particular moment? What power raises them up? What power controls whom, Kennedy? <laughs> I think we're not communicating. In the case of Jesus, the Holy Spirit did raise him up on the third day. But now in the case of these two witnesses who have been killed, who is raising them up? Right, the angelic forces yeah, or the Holy Spirit? That's Revelation chapter 11, verse 11. Yeah. Revelation 11, 11. It says, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. So God has raised them up. Okay, so let's look at the other one. Uh, Prabhakar's question. Is it possible God can take others also like Elijah and Enoch? Is it possible? Of course it's possible. Uh, is God going to do it? I don't know, right? So uh, is God going to take other people up to heaven like Elijah and Enoch uh, physically? Uh, uh, I, I don't know. God can do do it if he wants to do it again. But is he going to take others up? We don't have, see, other than Enoch and Elijah, we don't have any other uh, precedent uh, that just randomly believers are taken up into heaven. So, uh, yeah. Can God do it? Of course he can. He can do whatever he desires. Uh, is he going to do it? We don't know, right? Um but there's nothing given to us in scripture that that's something we should expect instead what the bible does tell us is that you know it's appointed to man wants to die after that the judgment hebrews 9:27 okay shrikumar you you've put a word rapture there i'm not sure what what you meant no uh, i just meant to say um, like how the god is to, god took elijah and uh, you know the rapture is also represents the same thing that's it mm. thank you yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the big difference is in the rapture, our bodies are instantly changed to, to become immortal bodies. Uh, but we don't see that happen for Enoch or Elijah, right? So for both of them, uh, the Bible doesn't state that their bodies were transformed. In our case, in, at the rapture, our mortal will put on immortality, right? So our bodies will be trans transformed to be like Jesus glorified body, right? So that's the difference. But um, chapter 11 doesn't actually tell us two witnesses are dropped down to the earth. It just says at that time they're given power. That's perfectly right. Uh, so it doesn't say they are dropped down to the earth. That's correct. Uh, I just said that it could be done because if God had the power to take them up, he has the power to drop them down. So it just uh, an opinion or what to say possibility chapter 11 doesn't state it uh, it's just you know because the question is how do these two witnesses come well one possibility is if he took them up he can drop them down down but we don't know right how god's going to do it that's entirely up to him uh, so if malachi chapter 4 is to be understood literally that is god said malachi 4 2 uh, or 4 4, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day. And if that, that same Elijah is going to come back, he's not going to come, he's not going to be born physically as a baby. 
because he wasn't taken up physically as maybe he was taken up and as an adult. So that same Elijah, the adult Elijah who was in heaven has to come back. Then we just have to think of what was the most likely way he's going to come back. Enoch, who lived 300 and some years, uh, sorry, I don't know, more than 300 years, was taken up as an adult. How was he going to come back? Well, most likely God's got to drop them back. Uh, so that's why uh, I made that statement. Okay. Uh, um, do, we, do we say that um, John the Baptist statement? I, I'm sorry, Beth. I, what did, what did, I, lost, I lost what you said. Um, is it correct to say John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so can we then think, okay, maybe this is a similar thing, because John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. He was born, he grew up. Um, so it could be these witnesses are born, grown up, but they have the spirit of Elijah and someone else. Um, it is possible, but like we had mentioned earlier, if you look at Matthew 17, 11 and 12, Jesus makes reference to both. He says, Elijah is coming. And verse 12, Elijah has already come. So the Elijah who has already come is John the Baptist who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. The Elijah who is coming is the Elijah that Malachi spoke about. So, if Malachi 4, so John the Baptist was not the fulfillment of Malachi 4 and verse 5, in the sense that Malachi 4 5 is talking about the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So John the Baptist is not the fulfillment of Malachi 4 5. He just came in the spirit and power of Elijah. The common the, the reason we're saying that is because he turned people back to the Lord. That was the parallel between Elijah and John the Baptist. But the prophecy of Malachi 4 or 5 has to be fulfilled. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 17, 11, Elijah is coming. And Malachi 4 or 5 says Elijah will come. Uh, could it be that somebody comes like uh, you know, like the same way it happened in John the Baptist. Could it be that way? It could be that way. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it cannot be, could be. But if Malachi said, Malachi 4 5 has to be fulfilled, literally. And Elijah and John the Baptist was not the fulfillment of Malachi. So, how God is going to send Elijah or fulfill Malachi 4 5 could be either somebody else is born and comes in the spirit and power of Elijah, okay. Or it could happen literally. That means the literal Elijah is sent back to the earth. And we just have to be open to both. Okay. Yeah. Um. Next question. Revelation 9.15. So the four angels have been prepared, who had been prepared for the RNA. Who are these four angels? Um, uh, they're angels of God. We know that. Um, what else do we know? We don't know anything else other than... Uh, Sorry, Revelation. Sorry, you're talking about Revelation 9:15. Sorry, Revelation 9:15. So the four angels also for the Arandia who were released to kill a third mankind. So, sorry, I have to take that back. Revelation 9:15 were released from the river Euphrates. Right, release the four angels who are bound in the river Euphrates. So uh, we don't know. I mean, we don't know who these angels are. Uh, most likely. Um, they are bad angels because they've been bound. Good angels, that means the angels who are God's angels are with them in heaven. 
the fallen angels, the angels who rebelled against God or disobedient to God are the ones who are bound. And so most likely they are, these are the angels who have been bound, who are opposed to God, who are released. And beyond that, we don't know who these four angels are. So anything else would be speculation. Uh, Elisha, can the breath of God be said to be the Holy Spirit? So Elisha is referring to uh, Revelation 11. 11. Our answer is yes. Right? And, and and a good a good uh, way to validate that is, you know, uh, when Jesus breathed on them, people uh, in John 20, he said, breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who would give them life. But at the same time, uh, their 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 own spirit obviously comes back into their bodies and their bodies are resurrected on. So the Holy Spirit is the one who raises them up, the God who does it. But their human spirit comes back in their bodies and they're raised up. Okay. Revelation 9, 13. The sixth angel sound. The next question from Christopher. Uh, so the, is this coming from God or Satan? Uh, the sixth angel sound, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. 913. Um, saying to the sixth angel, who at the time released the four angels about. So this is from God, right? Revelation 913. So this instruction is from God, Revelation 9.13, um, uh, it's coming from the golden altar, which is before God. So it has to come from heaven. Uh, and now whether it's the voice of God or voice of an angel, we don't know. But he says, I heard a voice from the four horns. Uh, so it could be most likely God speaking, but it isn't stated clearly. And so saying, do this. So the instruction is from God. Uh, Okay, Revelation 9.13. Uh, sorry, Pastor. So, um, um, in, in the Revelation 9.13, uh, sixth angel um, says that, um, oh, sorry, saying to the sixth, uh, sixth angel, release the four angels who are bound with the great river of Euphrates. Uh, Euphr uh, Euphrates. So, um, now I just want to kind of understand: um, Is there any play of the of of the of Satan in this in this entire thing, or is this all coming from from God? Um, uh, you know, in in all these in all these um, events that are happening. Mm. So, in uh, all of these judgments are ordained by God, right? God is saying, God is the one who's determined these things. The seal. Uh, it's Jesus who's opened the scroll, and this is what God has ordained. So these judgments are God's judgments on the earth. Now, of course, Satan is doing his work on the earth, but if you're asking about the uh, seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls, these were determined by God. So in, in a sense, it is in a, in a, in a, it is kind of a, uh, repeat of you know what actually happened during during the time of of noah uh you know where, where the tent uh in a, in a in a in a smaller way i guess um you know where the entire world was uh, you know, uh, destructed mm -hmm. yeah definitely so what we are seeing in in, in the tribulation is something just like the, the world what what the world has never seen before right so it's 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 like this is the last final set of judgments and it's it's like what the world has never seen before that god is judging okay so we were in revelation 11 and um so we're talking about these two witnesses yeah so you know i, I I'm not saying you know we we have all the information for certain. We just go by the scriptures, and then the rest of it is 
basically okay it could be this or it's it's you know our best guess so uh, when we say who are these two witnesses well we know for sure one is elijah because god specifically said i'll send elijah uh, the other one well some people say enoch or moses and you know if you ask me it's my guess would be enoch but you know people have other ideas as well so it's fine we don't want to fight over it uh, we just you know look at each one's reasoning okay that's fine um and uh, and we see what you when know, we just go by what the information we've given the rest is you know left to our understanding of the rest of scripture uh, that we could come up with some possibilities or possible ways this is going to play out so there are these two witnesses antichrist kills them they're going to be on the earth for 42 months doing their work you know and uh, uh, they're bearing witness to the Lord, doing mighty signs and wonders. Antichrist kills them towards the end of the 42 months. They are de lying dead for three and a half days in the streets of the city of Jerusalem. The whole world sees them. And then at the end of the three and a half days, um, they are raised up, they are resurrected, and they ascend physically up into heaven, which is a big sign to the whole world that, yeah, this is God. Right? Now, so we pick up from there. This is from Revelation 11, 13, that at this moment, there's, there's a great earthquake uh, and uh, the city of Jerusalem is, uh, is uh, shaken. And it says 7,000 people died. So, you know, if the Bible says 7,000, we just say, okay, 7,000 people died. Uh, why is it specified 7,000? Well, that's what John saw. That's what John wrote. Uh, that's all we can say, right? Uh, is there any significance in the number 7,000? Why not 8,000? Why not 12,000? We don't know. Uh, it says that it says 7,000 people were killed um, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. So this is going to be a, 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 whole, a whole whole event that really shakes people up uh, and, they, and it's going to turn their attention to God. It doesn't mean they will all be saved. Uh, it just says that they recognize this as God, right? And uh, then, uh, then okay. So this is, you know, um, almost like an, another parenthetical, but a literal thing that's happening, right? So, chapter eleven takes us to through the forty-two months from the time the temple is desecrated till the witnesses ascend to heaven, takes us through the second half of the tribulation. But it is in, in context with the two witnesses, okay? To tell you about the two witnesses, it goes from the middle of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation in connection with the two witnesses. Having That having happened, then the seventh trumpet sounds. So it, uh, yeah, verse 14 says, okay, so far things have happened now comes the third woe that means this is a the last set of judgments the third woe comes so seven trumpet sounds which is the announcement of the last and final set of judgments and when the seven trumpet sounds uh, there is a great declaration in heaven uh, declaring that god is going to triumph ultimately Right, that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. So it is a proclamation anticipating what is going to be wrapped up very soon. You know, I mean, we, we are reaching the climax. There's going to be this final woe, third woe, he says in verse 14, Revelation 11, 14, uh, which is the final set of judgments and uh, the third woe. And, uh, you know, uh, the second woe, the second set of judgments is over, seven to seventh trumpet will sound, second set of judgments over. Here now is the final set. And then it's all going to climax with the kingdoms of our world becoming the kingdoms of our Lord in Christ. That means Christ is going to come and rule forever and ever. So there is this great proclamation of in anticipation of what's how things are going to wrap up. But then we still have these uh, this third woe, which has to be poured out on the earth. So in chapter 12, we have uh, chapters 12 and 13, yeah, or, yeah, 
I would say 12, 13, 14, just like chapter 11. Before we get into the, you know, the 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 last set of seven judgments, the seven bold judgments, which starts in the 15th chapter. Like chapter 11, chapter 12, 13, and 14 are uh, giving us insight into other things that are happening in the second half of the tribulation. So we know we're in the second half of the tribulation because chapter 11 has ushered us into that. Chapter 11, the focus was on two witnesses. Chapter 12, the focus is on Satan's attack on Jerusalem, on, on Israel, sorry. Chapter 13, the focus is on the beast and the false prophet, what they will do. And then chapter 14, the focus is on angelic announcements that will be made. And all this is happening in the 42 months, in the second half of the tribulation. And then we get into, okay, here are the seven last judge, the last seven judgments, the bowls that are going to be poured out. Okay, let me repeat. Chapter 11, the two witnesses, what they will do during 42 months. Chapter 12, how Satan is going after Israel during the second half of tribulation, 42 months. Chapter 13, the beast and the false prophet, that is the Antichrist and the false prophet, what they're going to be doing in the last 42 months. Chapter 14, there are five angelic announcements being made in the second half of the tribulation. So these are giving us insight what is going to happen in the second half of the tribulation. And then chapter 15 is all about, okay, here's the final bowl, the third bowl, which is the last seven bowls being poured out on the earth. Uh, you all with me so far? Nobody lost? Okay. So we're going to get into chapter 12. So what we see in chapter 12 is, um, is a very interesting picture. Um, and and here's, here's how I want you to uh, look at chapter 12. You know, uh, suppose you're narrating something to someone. And you're telling them a story or a sequence of events. Sometimes you come into part one, some particular event and then you say, well, I need to back up and I need to tell you something that happened a long time ago so that you understand what I'm saying right now. And then, so you, you start saying something, then you go back in time, you say something that happened maybe a long time ago, then you come back to where you were in the story and you continue on. And then you take that story forward. So that's like chapter, that's chapter 12. Because chapter 12 talks about the, uh, the old, uh, the, the dragon. Uh, and it says, hey, this dragon, I, I want to tell you something about this dragon. He drew a third of the stars with him. So that's going back in time and saying, hey, this was the dragon who took one third of the angels of God. So we're going back in time and saying, hey, we're giving a little bit of history to who this dragon is. That's, of course, Satan, Lucifer. Right? He drew a third of the angels. And the woman and the man-child. So there's a dragon representing Satan. The woman represents Israel because she gave birth to the man-child. Who is the man-child? Very easy. He's the one who's going to rule the nations with the rod of iron. That's Jesus Christ. So he was born to the woman, the nation of Israel, and he was going to rule all the nations. And the child was caught up to God and his throne. That's Jesus. He was taken up into heaven. So very clearly we know the woman is the nation of Israel. The man-child is Jesus Christ. And the dragon is the serpent. The woman we know is Israel because it says that she was clothed with the sun, the moon, and she had 12 stars. And that is exactly from Genesis 37, where uh, Joseph had the dream, the sun, the moon, and the stars, 12 stars. So it's, it's taking that picture here. So if you have a little bit of background history, 
you understand it. Oh, this, this has to be Israel because the sun, the moon, the 11 star, or the, the 12 stars representing uh, Jacob, Israel, and the, the 12 tribes. So it's pretty straightforward to interpret the images that you're seeing in Revelation 12. And uh, here once again, verse six, Revelation 12, six, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God and they should feed her there 1,260 days, that is 42 months or three and a half years. So it's again talking to us about the second half of the tribulation. So for 42 months, this dragon is going to attack the woman. That means for 42 months, Satan, the second of the tribulation, Satan's um, anger, it's towards Israel. Why? Because she gave birth birth to the man child that's she's male child that's jesus christ right? he's going out all august and then uh then suddenly you see in chapter chapter 12 from verse 7 to uh, 12 is a picture of spiritual warfare of angel angels at war and there has been a lot of uh debate of, on this passage you know whether it's a Passage is talking about things that already happened, or is it something that is going to happen? So there's been, and you have scholars on both sides. So there will be some scholars and commentaries that you read uh, where they say, you know, Revelation 12, 7 to 12 is something, is descript, describing something that took, past, took place in time past. And then there will be scholars uh, who say that it is going to happen at that time during the uh, tribulation so my understanding and so again this is my understanding i'm, I'm not I'm, I'm recognizing that there are different differing opinions on this but my understanding is revelation 12 7 to 12 is talking about what will happen at that particular time in the tribulation simply because of the sequence of events so it's talking about satan making a final attempt to enter into heaven uh, you know, he's been cast out a long time ago uh, and he's operating in the second heavens in the, he in, the, in the spiritual atmosphere. And he's trying to make his way in, trying to enter in the third heavens. But Michael and the angels, the archangels, they say, no way. You're not going to come into this place. And uh, he's forbidden. There. And, and he's, he's only, he, hon his only option is to do something here on earth. So he comes back. He's, he's thrown down to the earth with, and he comes to the earth with a lot of anger saying, okay, he knows his time is short. So again, that's another reason why I feel Revelation 12, 7 to 12 is talking about something that will happen during the tribulation because it says he knows his time is short. So obviously, you know, it's not something happened in the past. It's happening right then during the tribulation. And he's thrown down. And what, what is he after? Revelation 12, 13. He goes, he persecutes the woman who gave birth to the male child, Revelation 12 and verse 13. Right? And then it says, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly into the wilderness um, to her place where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time. That is three and a half years, 1,263 days from the presence of the serpent. So God provides a place for this woman to for this the people of Israel. So women representing Israel, it means people, Jewish people, for them to be preserved in some way. He's going to protect them for this time, times, and half a time, or three and a half years. Now, uh, you know, sometimes people you people may interpret the wings of a great eagle to mean America. Okay. Uh, I don't think so, but sometimes you might hear that uh, you know, because of course the uh, the great eagle is, is a symbol of the uh, American nation. So sometimes people may use that, you know, okay, okay. But um, I just feel that this is a figurative speech of saying that she is going to be, like just like how the eagle is able to rise up way high above the storm and above, way up in the sky to, you know, God is going to provide 
the Jewish people a means to escape the onslaught of the devil during this 42 months, 1,260 days, 260 days or three and a half years. That's all it means. Uh, I, I don't think we should take that just because it says great eagle and use that to apply it to America. I don't think that's the right way to interpret scripture here. But that's a side note. Okay. And now verse 15 talks about how the devil goes against this woman and you know God protects it and um, protects the people. And verse 17, now notice it, he goes, um, with, he was enraged with the woman, that's the Jewish people. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So very interesting. It means, this is Revelation 12 and verse 17. It means there will be Jewish people um, who keep the commandment of God and keep the testimony of Jesus Christ. Meaning there could be these Jewish people who are also turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Revelation 12, verse 17. And uh, the, Satan is going after them with great vengeance. Okay, so let's pause here. Um, uh, I see Beth's comments, great eagle could be aeroplane evacuation of Jews. Maybe, uh, why not? You know, uh, we don't know, it could be, right? Uh, uh, but God provides some way in which these people are taken uh, into the wilderness, a place of safety and uh, where they are preserved, right? So, so Revelation 12, 6, the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of one. Is it a real place? Uh, so, uh, so the answer, is this a real place? Yeah, it's a physical place. Uh, what I have read, again, this is just commentary that people have written, is that the area, uh, there's a certain area towards the west, sorry, the, the east or side of Israel. That's just like a barren uh, wilderness-like land. Uh, uh, and I think it's in or in and towards Jordan, Jordan, right? The neighboring country. So some people say, and again, this is just commentary that this is like a, a uninhabited area. So it's very likely that the Jews will escape into this place uh, and be preserved there. It's just one of the, uh, you know, one of the, what to say, commentaries or things. So, uh, Divya's question, the answer is, yeah, it's a literal place. It's a, it says into the wilderness. That means it's a dry, deserted, barren place. It's a wilderness. So yes, it's a literal place um, uh, where they will be preserved. That God will supernaturally protect them and uh, and keep them there. All right, so um, yeah, Anita, I do not understand your comment. Maybe it's referring to slavery of Israelites in Egypt. Um, why would it refer to Egypt? Um, um, yeah, so we don't know, you know, we don't know where this place is. Any any guess would be a, just a guess, right? Whether they're going to be going to Egypt, that is down south, whether they're going to go east into Jordan, or we don't know, right? Uh, could God do use Egypt again as a place where they were preserved? He could. Um, what we do know from uh, Daniel chapter 12, is um, actually Daniel chapter 11 is that when the Antichrist comes into power, uh, there will be kings from the south, uh, from the south and from the north who are going to come into conflict with him. Kings from the south, of course, are referring to Egypt. So we know that part from Daniel 11. So there's going to be conflict between the Antichrist and the kings of the south. So if there's going to be this conflict happening, which is given to us in Daniel 11, would that be a place where 
the Jews would be safe. I doubt. I don't know. Right. But I'm just I'm, again. We don't know where this wilderness is. Could we don't know exactly. Uh, we can think of several options, um, but I think uh, it's just it's okay to leave it as it is. Yeah, uh, there are different commentaries and different people who have different thoughts on it, and that's fine. And uh, so Antichrist won't have access. To, so I see the obvious question. So Antichrist won't have access to that place. Well, he's going to be. Um, well, God is going to protect his people, so he could have access, but he. Men won't be able to penetrate because God is protecting his people. Now, how God protects the Jews there, whether it's through the means of uh, some other, the, you know, military or some other nation, or whether it's just totally supernatural, we don't know. But it just tells us here that God is going to, you know, in, in Revelation 12, um, verse 6, and also in verse 14, that uh, these people are protected here. Uh, from the serpent for three and a half years. So how they are protected, whether it is through the intervention of some other country, or it is just totally supernatural, uh, we don't know. But God is protecting the Jewish people there in what is referred to as a wilderness. Yeah. All right, Christopher, your question, please. Uh, yes, Pastor. Uh, so I... I mean, just just going through this, uh, you know, it um, you know there seems to be a lot of um, uh, you know destruction, disasters, things that are happening uh, at a very large scale. Mm. Uh, perhaps even more than you know that um, that man himself or humans can even sort of uh, be capable of doing um, mm. or have actually done, um, and. Um, um, this is sort of like a precursor to, to the uh, you know to the uh, millennium, um, uh, you know, th th thousand years. So I guess my question is, um, in the overall kind of scheme of things, uh, or or our understanding of you know the significance of of this, um, whoever survives these these um, this d destruction and um, disasters. Um, they will be, um, will they all be, uh, you know, position to, uh, you know, be a, uh, be uh, good people, um, you know, special people who have, you know, have come through this and then are ready for, you know, or ready to take this forward, you know, this this thousand years. Um, uh, you know, what what is sort of the significance of, of you know these events and then you know the. Uh, you know, and then leading leading on to this thousand year period, I, I guess I just wanted to and mm -hmm. mind around that. Yeah. Mm. I think. I mean, if we as we journey through Revelation and and we come into Revelation twenty, when when we transition into the millennium. I understand your question. Your question is a very good question. Very good. Basically, you're saying, okay, what does all this serve? What purpose does all this serve? This, this, you know, this huge amount of um, destruction on the earth and the lives of people. What is this all leading up to? What is it serving? What purpose is it serving? And uh, it's a very good question. Uh, and I'm just trying to think. Uh, in terms of, you know, okay, as we progress and we come into the millennium, that is Revelation 20, uh, I think number one is the biggest thing that we see is the triumph of Christ. Um, the that it's it's like okay satan you know you've you've done all of this but ultimately christ triumphs whether this whole you, you know series of judgments causes people to be refined and you know to become good daniel 12 talks a little bit about that many will be refined and purified 
uh, Daniel Daniel mentions this in uh, I'll give you the exact verse. Uh, Daniel 12 talks about it. Uh, that many will well, give me the just um, Daniel 12. So he says, Daniel 12, you know, there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Your people will be delivered. And then he says, um, uh, uh, yeah, says um, those who sleep, some will rise up to everlasting life and so on. Um, and there will be those who will shine like the um, stars of heaven. So where's this? It's looking. Oh, verse 10, many, 10 and 12, 10, many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Um, so he seems to say, yeah, there will be those who um, uh, will be purified and refined. But does it mean that a large number of people will turn to the Lord? Uh, the answer is no. I mean, meaning, uh, Okay, let me retract that. There will be a lot of people who, are, who you know, return to the faith, but will die in the tribulation, and they will be raised up at the end. Revelation chapter twenty, verse two to four. Um, but the judgment itself is it going to prepare people for the, you know, for the tribulation? Uh, uh, I guess I'm trying to see how to answer your question. Yeah, it, it, it will bring a large number of people to faith, but there will also be, like we saw in Revelation nine, a lot of people who will deny, who will turn away from the faith. Right, so you'll have both, like Daniel twelve ten. There will be those who are refined, and that there will be those who refuse to be refined. So you'll have both sets of people, um, and but ultimately, the the, the 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 greatest thing that comes out of this is that you know Christ is. King of kings, Lord of lords, over all the rulers of the earth. So in the battle of Armageddon, the world's greatest leaders will be there. And Christ triumphs over them all. Okay, we'll see that in Revelation 20. Um, I don't know if I fully answered your question. Maybe I touched upon it a little, but uh, yeah. Okay. Let's wrap up for, for today. Uh, we'll continue this next week and uh, journey through Revelation, get an overview of events and so on. Uh, Anita, about Illuminati, um, yeah, uh, we will look at it in Revelation 13, but not about the Illuminati, but we'll look at what the Antichrist's agenda is in Revelation 13, right? So we'll pick that up uh, next week. All right, thank you all for your patience. Um, and uh, let's uh, close in prayer. May I request somebody to just pray with us? And, uh, and then we will dismiss. Anybody could pray, please. Father God, thank you for, for this day and for everything that you have uh, done to us. We want to say thank you for the lesson that we had today. We pray that the Holy Spirit will help us to understand and you give us more of your revelation that to mm -hmm. grow in your knowledge and in knowing mm -hmm. you. We even pray for various ministry that we are saving in. We pray for grace and uh, mercy and peace to be with us. And we mm -hmm. pray for our Father Father for his uh, sacrificial time and also for his family. We pray mm -hmm. that may you continue to bless them and equip mm -hmm. them in everything that they do. We mm -hmm. pray and we look forward to our trainings that are coming further concerning this subject. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your patience. And uh, let's continue this journey next week. God bless. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll uh, see you tomorrow morning. God bless. Bye now. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Elisha. Thank you, everybody. God bless.